Hey guys, in this video I wanted to work through assigning oxidation number and recognizing oxidation and reduction in organic reactions, and then looking at some oxidation and reduction reactions involving alcohols and carbonyl compounds. So in this first problem, we've got two organic reactions with carbons highlighted, and our goal here is to identify the oxidation number of each carbon, and whether oxidation or reduction or no change in oxidation level is occurring in each case. Okay, so first reaction, I've got a nitrile here, and the carbon of interest is this cyano or nitrile carbon. And to assign the oxidation number, we're going to think about this in terms of giving all the bonding electrons, and here there are six bonding electrons, three pairs, to the more electronegative nitrogen atom. That would leave the carbon atom here with a charge of positive three, and so the oxidation number of that carbon is positive 3. And in fact, if we look down at the second reaction, the second reaction also involves a nitrile and the cyanocarbon is of interest. And this is the exact same bonding pattern in both cases. And so in the second reaction as well, the oxidation number of that cyanocarbon is positive 3. Likewise, the oxidation number of the nitrogen is negative 3, right, since it inherits or accepts all three pairs of bonding electrons when we do this process of giving the electrons to the more electronegative atom. Okay, what about the product side of the first reaction? Well, here we have a carbonyl carbon now. The, the cyano or nitrile carbon has turned into a carbonyl carbon, and it's involved in a ketone. And so we have, if we imagine giving both pairs of bonding electrons in the CO double bond to the more electronegative oxygen atom, that's going to leave this carbon with a positive 2 charge. So the oxidation state here is positive 2. And if we look at the change in oxidation number in going from the reactant to the product here, we can see that at that cyanocarbon we go from plus 3 in the reactant to plus 2 at the carbonyl carbon in the product. That is a decrease in oxidation number and this corresponds to reduction. That carbon is undergoing reduction, and this makes sense. These organometallic reagents are sort of analogous to complex metal hydrides that are used in reductions, and so it makes sense that they affect reductions, for example, of nitriles. Now in the second case, let's examine this corresponding carbon in the product that was the cyanocarbon in the reactant. Here now, we do the usual process of giving all the bonding electrons to the more electronegative atom in each bond. That is the nitrogen here, so we give a pair to that nitrogen and both bonding pairs in the CN double bond to that nitrogen. That's going to leave this carbon with a positive 3 formal charge. So the oxidation number of that carbon is positive 3. And then again, if we compare that oxidation number to the oxidation number of that carbon in the reactant, what we'll notice it here is that there is no change in oxidation level in this reaction. And so this is what we would call in a sort of fancy way redox neutral at that carbon. The oxidation level of that carbon does not change here. So big takeaways from this problem. In assigning oxidation number, we really systematically follow this process of giving all the bonding electrons to the more electronegative heteroatom in the bond, and then look at the formal charge that results when we do that. Reduction corresponds to a decrease in oxidation number, oxidation to an increase in oxidation number, and for many reactions, we actually see no change in oxidation number, and those processes are sometimes called redox neutral. And the second problem here, we're asked to predict the major neutral product of each of these reactions. And in the first case here, we have sodium borohydride in ethanol solvent being combined with this organic substrate. Now interestingly here, we've got two carbonyl groups in this substrate. One of them is connected to an H and a CH2. That's an aldehyde functional group. The other one is connected to a carbon and a nitrogen, and this is an amide, right, when a nitrogen or amino type group is connected to a carbonyl group. And so the aldehyde is a ketohyde, as, as we would call it, and the amide is a carboxylic acid derivative. So these are fundamentally different, particularly in their reactivity with NaBH4, with sodium borohydride. Now let's talk about NaBH4 for a second. This is the Na plus, or sodium cation, and the BH4 minus anion. And BH4 minus is 
a strongly nucleophilic species with very nucleophilic hydrogens. Since hydrogen is more electronegative than boron, most of the electron density in these BH bonds is at the hydrogen. And so this is a nucleophilic source of hydrogen. And what's going to occur here is addition of hydride, nucleophilic addition of hydride to the carbonyl carbon, Whoop. and formation of an alkoxide intermediate that's rapidly protonated to form an alcohol. So it's a reduction process. Sodium borohydride is a reducing agent. And our product here, we're going to have an OH group where the carbonyl group was. And here it's helpful, I think, and you want to be really careful to count carbons. So we have, if we label the aldehyde carbonyl carbon 1, 2, and nitrogen is three, we want to make sure to account for both of those carbons, one and two, in the product. And so nitrogen is at position three. We've got the five-membered ring. And then there's the question of what we do with the amide. Is the amide reduced? Well, we can certainly envision a mechanism in which borohydride adds to, uh, delivers hydride, if you will, to the carbonyl carbon. And we end up with something like this OH group here after protonation of the oxygen and an H here. However, sodium borohydride is not a strong enough reducing agent to convert amides into reduced products. The issue is that the amide itself is not very electrophilic. This is actually why I highlighted its carbonyl carbon in purple rather than blue. Because this nitrogen is a pretty good electron donor, the carbonyl carbon of the amide is not a great electrophile. It takes a lot of a weak nucleophile or a very strong nucleophile to engage with that carbonyl carbon. And sodium borohydride just won't do the job. Sodium borohydride reacts much more rapidly with the aldehyde as opposed to the amide. So the aldehyde will selectively be reduced in the presence of the amide here. All right, in the second case, we have pyridinium chlorochromate, or PCC. Now, this is an oxidizing agent, kind of in the family of chromium-based oxidizing reagents. What makes this reagent unique, however, is that no chromic acid actually forms, and the conditions are anhydrous. There's no water in the reaction conditions. So we use PCC in a dry organic solvent, something like methylene chloride, that you see right here. And this prevents oxidation of an intermediate aldehyde up to a carboxylic acid, meaning we can take a primary alcohol and oxidize it to an aldehyde, stopping at that stage without over-oxidation to the carboxylic acid. In this substrate, then, we're looking for an alcohol, and we see two hydroxyl groups. And so the question of what gets oxidized is, is interesting here. I'm going to copy the substrate over. And first, let's engage with the more sort of conventional um, benzylic alcohol here, which is just basically your standard alkyl alcohol type of deal. This can be oxidized to an aldehyde. That corresponds to the loss of H2 from the primary alcohol. And we end up with something like this. But there's this question of whether this alcohol gets oxidized as well. One thing we should notice is that if we try to simply remove hydrogen and add a double bond right here, we're going to run into some pretty serious problems because this carbon now has five bonds, and that's a no-no. So that suggests that no oxidation can occur here. And in fact, there's no way to push electrons around to draw an oxidized product that is reasonable or plausible. One thing we should notice, for example, if we try to do something like this, well, this is actually not a net oxidation for one thing. That's worth pausing the video and meditating on for a little bit. The other thing is this destroys aromaticity. So this kind of oxidation, even something like adding an oxygen here, which would correspond to a bona fide oxidation, that's going to destroy aromaticity. And so that's energetically unfavorable. And so the phenol hydroxyl group remains untouched under these oxidizing conditions. And with PCC, we stop at the aldehyde stage right here. And so our product is this benzaldehyde derivative. All right. The third case, we have chromium trioxide and sulfuric acid. That's going to make chromic acid, H2CrO4, in the reaction mixture. 
and we're under aqueous conditions since that H2SO4 there implies that there's water around. This is going to oxidize any primary alcohols all the way up to the carboxylic acid. This substrate includes two functional groups that might be of interest. We have an ether right here, and we have this primary alcohol right here. And as above, the primary alcohol is initially oxidized to an aldehyde. Let's just briefly draw that aldehyde intermediate. But under these aqueous reaction conditions, that aldehyde is going to get hydrated and oxidized further, and ultimately we're going to end up substituting that H with an OH. And the ether here is more or less unreactive. The acidic conditions might cause some trouble for that ether, but the major product is going to include the ether intact with the primary alcohol oxidized to a carboxylic acid. And again here, in this case and above, be careful not to lose any carbons when you do these, these oxidations. The CH2 carbon in CH2OH becomes the carbonyl carbon in the product. So for example, if we number one, two, three here, we still see one, two, three atoms in their corresponding places in the product. And similarly down here, if we go one, two, and three, the product still has those atoms one, two, and three. And we haven't added or removed any carbons in the oxidation process. All right. In the last case, we have lithium aluminum hydride. This is structurally analogous to sodium borohydride that we saw above, except the hydrides in lithium aluminum hydride are much more nucleophilic and much more reactive than the hydrides in sodium borohydride. And if we look now at the substrate, now that we've recognized lithium aluminum hydride is a reducing agent, we're looking for reducible functional groups, electrophilic carbons, for example, in the substrate. And two jump out at my eye. There's the ester carbonyl carbon, and then there's the cyano carbon. We actually already saw this being reduced in the first problem here. Um, we saw a nitrile carbon being reduced to a ketone carbonyl carbon by ethyl Grignard reagent, and so it's reasonable to expect that that might happen down here as well. And lithium aluminum hydride is more than reactive enough to reduce both esters and nitriles. Let's talk about the ester first, since this involving a carbonyl group is uh, a little more conventional, we might say, a little bit closer to what you typically see uh, in lecture, for example. So what's going on with the ester? Well, initially we add hydride. A number of people added hydride and protonated and just stopped here, generating something that resembles an alcohol. The issue, however, is that an alkoxide intermediate would form first. And this is capable of kicking out an ethoxide leaving group to create an aldehyde. And this will happen to generate an aldehyde intermediate pretty rapidly. And so we get an aldehyde initially, and that aldehyde is susceptible to further reduction. And this is completely uncontrollable. That lithium aluminum hydride is going to come in, deliver another equivalent of hydride. We're going to get a primary alkoxide intermediate, and that will get protonated on workup to generate a primary alcohol. So the ester is reduced all the way to a primary alcohol via what I like to call double addition of hydride. Hydride adds twice, two equivalents of hydride add. Ethanol is lost as a byproduct. That alkoxy group of the ester is lost as a byproduct, and there we go. The nitrile also reacts because the nitriles or cyanocarbon is electrophilic. That CN triple bond is structurally analogous to the carbon oxygen double bond of the carbonyl group. And so this is susceptible to reduction as well through actually a similar mechanism, very similar mechanism, where we can first add hydride. And I'm actually going to rearrange this so that that nitrogen's geometry makes a little more sense. So we initially get something like this. We can imagine this getting protonated under the reaction conditions to generate a neutral product here. But again, this is susceptible to further reduction. And lithium aluminum hydride is more than reactive enough to reduce this imine, the carbon nitrogen double bond we call an imine functional group. So a second equivalent of hydride can be delivered similar to the ester, right? The cyanocarbon and the ester carbonyl carbon are at the same oxidation level. 
that's going to leave negative charge on this nitrogen. And then on workup, that gets protonated, and we end up with an NH2 group on the end here. So overall, that substrate picked up four equivalents of hydride and picked up some protons as well under the aqueous workup conditions. And so this is quite the reduction that we're seeing here. And lithium aluminum hydride, again, is a ravenous reducing agent capable of doing these kinds of reductions. Finally, in this problem, we're asked to provide a chemically plausible mechanism with curved arrows and all reactive intermediates for this reaction. And we can start by simply abbreviating the benzene rings, pH, 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 pH. That benzene ring can be abbreviated as pH. I'm going to do this throughout the mechanism. Okay, how do we get started here? Well, take a look at the reagents. What can we infer about the reagents? Sodium borohydride. We already noted sodium cation, borohydride anion. That borohydride anion is a great source of hydride, and so it is reducing. It's going to deliver hydride H- minus to all manner of electrophilic groups. Well, not really all manner of electrophilic groups because borohydride isn't that reducing, but it's certainly reducing enough to engage with a ketone carbonyl carbon, which is electrophilic and susceptible to reduction. And so to begin thinking about this, drawing out a Lewis structure for BH4- minus is a good idea, and the BH bond is going to be the nucleophile here. There are no lone pairs on the boron. We don't want to dissociate the hydride first since there's actually no experimental evidence that hydride is lost from BH4- and sodium hydride and related alkali metal hydrides actually don't work nearly as well in these kinds of reductions. And so we're just going to directly deliver hydride this way to the carbonyl carbon and push the CO pi electrons up to oxygen, classic nucleophilic addition type of mechanism. And that's going to lead us to an alkoxide structure in which we have a new CH bond. This is one of the bonds that we need to make in the product, right? There's an implied hydrogen here that we need to add. And now there's negative charge on the oxygen. We've also generated BH3. And I do want to write this out just to make a quick point. It is possible to draw this alkoxide as coordinated to the boron. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. What is problematic, however, is using BH3 as an acid. This is not a very good acid. And so what we want to avoid at this stage is protonating the alkoxide by doing something like this. Oxygen is more electronegative than boron. It would much rather have negative charge than boron. So this is a heavily, heavily disfavored proton transfer step. Instead of all that, the alkoxide is going to hang around until we add water. And sodium borohydride can actually be used with water um, pretty remarkably without decomposition for these kinds of ketone and aldehyde reductions. It's kind of remarkable. So this may not even be a, in workup. This may be um, actually during the reaction itself. But we're going to transfer a proton to that oxygen, and that gets us to the neutral product. So this is pretty standard mechanism for reductions involving sodium borohydride of ketones and aldehydes. In the first step, we add that hydride nucleophile using the BH sigma bond as a nucleophile. That generates an alkoxide, and that alkoxide is protonated by water, or if we're using an alcoholic solvent, ethanol, methanol, could be uh, a proton from the OH group of that alcohol. And this gets us to a neutral alcohol product. In this case, a secondary alcohol, since we've got two carbon groups and an H connected to the carbon bearing the hydroxyl group.